Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation, Yuda and Yonit and Benny, and um, thank you all for coming. So uh, we talked about one-way functions, which are uh, like the bread and butter of cryptography, but uh, now it's time for the cake. So pseudo randomness uh, it's a wonderful thing, and uh, I try to convince you that it's a wonderful thing. But no matter what I say, remember that even if the talk is not uh, magical, one well, uh, pseudo randomness is uh, a magical concept. So, um, okay. So in general, uh, pure randomness is, uh, is a very useful uh, resource. Like we, we use all the time random bits. I use them, you use them, even though you, you're not always aware that you use them. And they're not only useful in cryptography, we'll see later, like uh, even this evening, that uh, they are necessary. So uh, we really need them, uh, but typically they're expensive. Like generating random bits is an expensive operation. So uh, in the next uh, hour or so, we're going to try to reduce the, the cost of this uh, uh, resource. And, um, and the approach that we'll have is going to be the following. So we'll try to start with a few random bits, okay, a few dollars, and try to expand them into many, many uh, random bits. Right? So imagine that we have a machine that takes like $5 and the outputs like $100. Right? So that, that's a magic, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, please stop me if you have questions right, about dollars or, or random bits. Okay. So, so, uh, so here's an uh, initial attempt. So we want uh, this machine, this uh, uh, function G, to be deterministic, to be efficient. So for me, efficient is polynomial time, but, but you can think about uh, other notions of efficiency. And uh, we want to expand the short random, uh, uh, short, uh, a random string, so usually it's called the seed, into a very long a, a random string. Right? So we start from n random bits. So when you plug in these random bits into this deterministic function, you get a distribution in the outputs. Right? So the, the, the random choice here induces a distribution of the n bit strings. And ideally, we would like the string to look exactly as a uniformly uh, string. Right? So it is a match. Right? You start from a short random string, you have a longer string, which looks exactly as n random bits. So this is a very uh, a nice uh, notion, very nice definition. Uh, and whenever we see a definition in cryptography, we should ask uh, whether it's achievable, right? Okay, can we achieve this, this notion? And the answer is no. No, okay, why? So this, this small picture shows exactly why it's not achievable. So let's look at the image of this uh, uh, mapping. So it contains only two to the n strings, right? And we know that n is shorter than n, therefore it cannot cover all possible n-bit strings. So this random variable cannot look exactly as this random variable because there are some strings in the support of this uh, uh, red uh, distribution that, are not, that, that cannot be obtained in this uh, uh, green distribution. So this is impossible, so uh, what do we do now, usually? Well, so we have to relax the definition, right? We can add fancy words like pseudo or something like this, but, but, but uh, you know, it, it, more generally, we have a definition, we want to achieve something, so we, we can't do it, so let's try to relax our requirements. So here's the relaxation, so this S will stand for statistical. So we want the output to be statistically close to a random string, so, so to say that something is statistically close, we have to introduce a metric, right? some uh, notion of distance. So what does it mean to be a statistical close? So here is a, a one a notion of a, a closeness. So we want that for every event A, the probability that this event happens here is roughly the same as the probability that this event happens here. Okay, so for those of you so, which are not like, I don't know, maybe familiar uh, or have a, a probability um, theory right in, in their heads, so an event for me is just a Boolean function. Right, so in this case it's just uh, this event A it's just a function from n bits to a single bit. Right? And the event happens if this, the value of this function is 1. Okay? So we quantify over all possible events, and we want that the event, that every event that happens here with probability p, say, should ha will happen, oh, let's start from the red part, that happens here with probability p should, should happen here with probability p plus minus epsilon, where epsilon is some negligible uh, quantity. Right? So example for these events can be, I don't know, uh, uh, the humming weight of the string is uh, at most uh, two-thirds uh, of n, right? Or, I don't know, the parity of these bits is uh, one. Or this string, when you think about it as an integer, it's a prime integer, right? You can define all sorts of events, 
Right? And every such an event should happen here with roughly the same probability. Okay. So this is a very nice definition. It looks very uh, useful, right? It's very strong. It, uh, it seems that if you have this notion, then you are essentially you have almost a, a random a, a, a string, which seems very useful for applications. Can we achieve it? No. So we can't achieve it. Uh, uh, and why can't we achieve it? Good. So we have uh, a good student here, which is my postdoc, who uh, you know we switched the answers before uh, before the talk. So so it's still impossible. And uh, we can define an event, right? Exactly as Gilad said. So the event says, is y in the image of the uh, of this uh, function g, right? So if this if this happens, then uh, we say that the event a happens. And you can see that the probability that this event happens on the green uh, string is one, right? This string is always in the image. What's the probability that the, that the, the red part falls in the image? So it's on the slide, right? But it's, so it's its most 2 to the n over 2 to the n, right? So this area right, the, uh, covers at most 2 to the n strings. Uh, if it's 1 to 1, it's really 2 to the n, but maybe the, this function is not 1 to 1, we didn't uh, require that. So it's, uh, it's bounded by 2 to the n over 2 to the n, the size of all the space. And this ratio is at most half, because we know that n is shorter than n. So even in the trivial case where we try to expand the input by a single bit, we see that there are events which, are very, which happen with very different probability on both sides. So the green and red really look uh, uh, different. So what do we do now? We have to further relax uh, our definition. And, uh, and now we, we, we are going to do something uh, uh, smart. In the sense that all that we, uh, all, all the things that we did uh, so far could have done like I don't know in the 18th century or even before that, right? Markov could have defined these this notions of uh, statistical process. Maybe he did it. Uh, but now we have to take computational power into account, which is a new concept, right? A new. And we're going to uh, restrict our attention only to events which are efficiently computable. So now I'm going to say that these two solutions are computationally closed. If for every event which is efficiently computable, so this means we said that an event is just a function, a Boolean function. So this means that you can compute this function efficiently, say in polynomial time or by a polynomial size circuit. We can have all sorts of uh, different notions of efficiency. And we quantify over all these events. So for all these events, so all efficiently computable events, the probability of that the event happens here and that the event that happens there is uh, the same up to epsilon, uh, absolute negligible uh, gap. Is it clear? Okay. So can we achieve this notion? No, maybe. So prove it. <laughs> and then we'll have a next uh, school about your result. So, um, so we can make a few observations. Let's work with the answer whether it's, it's, uh, uh, it's achievable or not. So the first observation is that this is a strict relaxation of statistical theorems. Right? I mean, previously we, uh, we quantified over all possible events. Now we quantify over all efficiently computable events. So this is a strict subset of all possible of all events. So that's a, a, a relaxation. So that's nice. And one thing that we can uh, uh, see is that we must require, if we want to achieve this thing, that deciding if a string is in the image of this function should be computationally hard. Why? Otherwise, we can apply the previous argument, right, and, and show that this is impossible, right? We can, otherwise, we have an efficiently computable event which distinguishes between the two distributions. And in fact, you can prove that this mapping G must be. So, your your uh, cryptographic dictionary is uh, kind of small right now. So, <laughs> right, I think it has a single terminator, or maybe two terms. So, it must be one way. Right. So G must be one-way function, and uh, this is an exercise. So if this function expands, if this M is much larger than N, say 10 times of N, then the proof is almost trivial. So you can show that uh, if you can invert this thing with, say, probability 1 over N, then you have an event. Right? You, you're going to use the inverter to invert the function and then check whether this, uh, 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 the, the pre-image is really the pre-image of, of Y. You can always check it. So this event will happen here with probability 1 over n, but will happen here only with exponentially small probability. Right? Because the probability that uh, this uh, string lies or, or hits the, the image is going to be exponentially small when n is very low. 
But uh, you can actually prove it even when M is slightly larger than N, and this is a nice exercise, so think about it. Right? Say that M is N plus 1, prove that this thing must be 1. How do you know it's a straight relaxation? Uh, you can prove it by counting. <laughs> Shannon did it, uh, I don't know, 50 years ago. So you can show that there are many functions which uh, don't admit uh, an efficient uh, realization. Okay. So... I don't know that it exists, of course, but I know that this notion is, uh, seems to be weak. Okay, so these are basic uh, observations. And uh, so this is going to be our notion of, uh, of uh, pseudo-randomness. Distribution which is computationally close to a uniform distribution. Right? And I want to present an alternative definition which is, uh, I don't know, it may be like, uh, less technical and, and it makes more sense, uh, at least intuitively. Ah, okay. And I wanted to, to mention another comment here. So you can phrase this definition as looking at this, the difference between this probability and this probability and putting it in an absolute value, right? Saying that the absolute value, the difference between these two things, is at most negligible. Right? That's the standard uh, uh, definition that you see in a textbook. So I want to say that without loss of generality, I can always assume that this is, uh, quantity is always larger than this one, right? And therefore, I can omit the absolute value and just write, the, uh, write it like this. Right, and why is it true? Why is this without loss of generality? So what happens if there is an event for which, uh, you know, a distinguishing event for which uh, the probability is, uh, the quantity is, is slightly larger than this one, what I'm going to do? To consider the complement of this event, and if the original event was efficiently computable, so is uh, the complement, right? So, so we can always, when we, when we prove things, we can always assume that we have this uh, inequality. Okay, so let me move to an equivalent uh, a view of, or alternative view of, uh, of uh, pseudo-randomness. So this is kind of inspired by the famous uh, Turing test, right? So we're going to define it uh, as a game. So we're going to do, uh, generate a pseudo-random string by plugging in a, a random C to the uh, PRG, to this uh, function G. And then we're going to generate a, a, a truly random string, Y0. And now we're going to toss a coin right, to the bit, and we're going to give our adversary, so now we think of events as adversaries, so this is an adversary, we're going to give him one sample, right, so the probability half we're going to give him a green sample, the probability half we're going to give him the red sample, right, and the goal of the adversary is to guess whether this string that he has in his hand comes from the green part or the red part, right, is he talking to a random uh, source or a pseudo-random source, right, like, like exactly like in, in Turing's uh, test, where you have to determine whether you're talking to a machine or a person. So, uh, so we said that the adversary wins if uh, his guess B prime equals to the real value B, right? If he said, if he said right or left in the right way. And you, we could define pseudo-randomness by saying that for every polynomial time adversary, the winning probability is most half plus negligible. So why do I put here the half? You can always guess, right? I mean, we cannot avoid this half because this adversary can be very weak. He could just toss the coin and he's going to be right with probability half. But I want to argue that, or I, want to, I can define pseudonymous by saying that, um, that he cannot do much better than half. Right? So the advantage or uh, the probability of guessing is at most half plus negligible amount. And it turns out that this uh, uh, alternative view is equivalent to the original definition that we had. So let's uh, prove it. So let's prove, say, one direction. So, so let's see. So what is the probability of winning? So the probability that we choose the uh, green part times the probability that the adversary gets right on the green part, plus the probability that we choose the red part uh, times the probability that the adversary gets right on the red part. Right? This is uh, uh, trivial. And now, so the probability that we choose this uh, green part is half, and the probability that we choose the red part is also half. So we can take the half out of the parentheses and we have these two uh, probabilities, and right? these two quantities. And now, I'm going to just switch the notation. I'm going to say, right, this is the, just the PRG. So this is the probability that, let's think now of A as an event. So the, the event happens on the PRG, right, when X is chosen at random. And here I can write it as 1 minus the probability that this is 1, right, because this is the probability of 0. So this is 1 minus the probability that the event happens on a uniform string. Right? And that's it, basically. Right, so I can take the one out, so I have this half plus 
the difference, right? And we know that the difference is bounded by negligible. This was the, the previous definition that we had. Okay? So we get half plus half of negligible, which is a negligible function. Okay? And the argument also goes in the other way around, basically. So you can show that the two uh, things are uh, two uh, notions are uh, equivalent. Is it clear? <coughs> questions? Please do ask questions, otherwise we'll finish all the slides in like five minutes. Okay. So let's talk about the uh, uh, properties of uh, what? Not necessarily a threat. <laughs> uh, well, the point is that after my talk, Riftach is going to be this talk. So any minute that you're going to reduce for my talk is going to be added. To that. So we're going to leave here uh, this, uh, the, the fixed time, right? There's a... Uh, so, okay. So some... Uh, uh, some, so let's try to understand this notion of pseudo-anonymous and let's try to, to investigate the properties of, of uh, pseudo-anonymous. So, so is a basic question. Say that we have uh, many uh, independent samples of the pseudo random generator. So we have a very long uh, or a collection of, of uh, green strings. Is it indistinguishable from a collection of uh, red strings, right? Independent collection of uniform strings. So this looks familiar, right? I mean, it's kind of, uh, it looks similar to the uh, problem that Eftach showed us in, the, uh, in an hour ago, like when he said, you know, when you concatenate many or when you apply a direct product of many uh, one-way functions, then it becomes the uh, harder, right? The inverting becomes a harder task. But here, actually, it works the other way around, right? Think of, think of, uh, of you as a distinguisher, right? From the distinguisher point of view, so we have some chance of distinguishing these two strings, but now he's getting an additional chance of distinguishing this pair. And now maybe it's possible, it's possible to distinguish this pair. And it suffices to win in a single game out of the, all these games. So in the previous case, for one way function, when you apply the direct product, you think of it as an end. In order to invert, you have to invert all the instances. So that's why how this uh, uh, um, is uh, amplified. Right? But here it suffices to break a single instance in order to break the whole thing. So it's like an O. So it's not clear that this thing remains pseudo-random, right? In fact, you can show that this is, this cannot be harder than the original thing because you can always ignore the last entries and just try to break a single entry. Right? So this is at most as hard as a, a, a the, the original uh, task, but maybe it's much easier. Maybe, you know, when you have a collection of uh, independent uh, pseudo-random strings, then maybe it's become easier to, to break it. So what do you think? Is it pseudo-random or not? But by independent pseudo-random strings, do we mean we receive every time? Yes, every yes. So think of x1, x2, x3 as uh, just independent random strings. Yeah. So, so we receive with the true generator? With the true random string, right? Yeah, you have the generator, it's a static notion. You could also think about related uh, inputs, but I'm not going to talk about it right now. We'll touch it later. So you have this fixed machine G, you, you, someone plugged in uh, several independent inputs, and then someone put on the table three truly random string, and you shuffled the two uh, sequences, and now you have to say which is which. Right? Is it easier, is it hard? You know that a single instance is hard. But is it still uh, uh, hard to distinguish between uh, a vector of instances? So what do you think? Yeah, so the title says a pseudo analysis is preserved under multiple samples, so I guess that the answer is yes. <laughs> but how do we prove it? Right. So we're going to prove it you know, by going back to the definition, showing that if you can distinguish with these two sequences, then you can break a single instance. Right, that's what we usually do in uh, uh, cryptography. You saw several examples in Iftar stock. We have, we have to present a reduction which shows that if someone can break this thing, like the big game, then you can actually use this uh, uh, distinguisher to break a single instance. Okay. Ideas? How can we do it? You just generate x to x to on your own and uh, let the algorithm distinguish. Okay, so you're saying, so here is a, a good suggestion by Boaz. He says, okay, so say that you have a distinguisher that distinguishes the vectors of length 3, right? So let's uh, feed this uh, distinguisher. So think about it as an algorithm. So it's a box. And it expects three instances, right? One, two, three, right? A vector of length 3. So each instance here is a, is a string, n bit string. So, but I'm giving, right, just a single string, right? And I want to tell whether this string is pseudo-random or random. 
So boss says, what, put it in? And then what? Two random guys. Okay. So you are going to choose two random guys. I mean geof randoms. Geof randoms or randoms? This is not the same. Two pseudo random guys. So I have to erase now. Okay, so this is G. No, the green line is geof. On the red line it's uniform. Here? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I found. What? I, I'm talking about the top line. On the top line. Uh -huh. No, there is no top line. The adversary gets a triple. The adversary gets a triple and he, say, he should distinguish between the case that uh, we know that the, uh, the adversary has a gap, right? We assume that the adversary has a gap between a, a green triple and the red triple. And now we want to come up with a new adversary that can distinguish between a single red uh, entry and a, a single uh, Re, re, um, green entry. Right, so let, let, let's, let's maybe let's use the slides. So let's assume that we have a, an adversary A. So this is A. Right. So A, a has a single, uh, it takes a single uh, triple, and we know that the probability that the answer is here uh, it says 1 here, the probability that it says 1 here are far from a part. Right? This is our uh, assumption. Right? So we assume that is a contradiction that these triples are not pseudo, pseudo random. Therefore, this A can distinguish, so it has some gap delta between uh, uh, um, the value that it says, uh, 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 so, so there is a gap between the probability that it says one on the green part and the uh, one on the red part. Okay, so this is what we have. What do we want to uh, prove? We want to come up with a new adversary B, which takes a single instance, okay, somehow, somehow distinguish has a gap between the red the case and the green case. Right. So even syntactically, right, A takes three inputs, and our new adversary B takes a single input. Okay, that's, that's, there is a difference. And we have to somehow, so, so was the original suggestion, or to somehow pet, so to pet this thing here, and somehow, somehow pet these guys. Right? It, it's, a, it's a very reasonable uh, approach, right? I mean, it's hard to see what else you can do. But how do we pet these guys? Right, so that, that's, that's actually the interesting question, right? I mean, so we can put it like a pseudo-random and random, and maybe the other way around, or maybe two random guys, or maybe two pseudo-random guys. It's not clear how to, how to embed this challenge in a triple, like how to fill in the blanks. <coughs> so before we show how to do it, let's, let's have a, a nice observation. So we can define other distributions of triples which gradually go from all green to all red. These are called hybrid distributions. So for example, in this case, I'm going to start with the first string is going to be uniform, but the other string is going to be pseudo-random. And there, you can define two uniform strings, and, and they put in the, th in the third entry the pseudo-random string, and so on, right? So I gradually move from all green to all red. Now, observe, the original algorithm, I had a guarantee that there's some gap between the all green and all red. That's the way people designed it. But once I have the algorithm, I can run it on any input, right? It's an algorithm, right? It works. I don't know how to evaluate the, uh, the performance of the algorithm, but I can plug in whatever I want, right? I have it in my hands. It's a box. So I can write, there is some probability that this thing, uh, that the algorithm outputs one on this triple. There is some, uh, some uh, uh, probability that the algorithm outputs one on this uh, triple, and so on. In fact, if you look at this picture, you can see that the gaps between all the hybrids together sum up to delta. Uh, this is just triangle inequality. Right? It's, it's a trivial effect. So this means that there must be two neighboring hybrids in which the gap is at least uh, delta over 3. Right? And you can replace this 3 by t if you have like t instances. Okay? So let's assume that we know this pair of neighboring hybrids. So what do I do now once I have these neighboring hybrids? How do you know the order is preserved? What do you mean by order is preserved? I didn't say uh, anything. I mean, maybe there are other things that are better, but uh, I, I'm just talking about this picture. So, the right order inequality doesn't have to be strict. It can go up on top and still have a large gap. Maybe I don't understand the question. So, so. The question is, why do you know that it's the middle two lines? And you, you, he said that maybe... I said there exists something. I said there exists, and with the of generality, let's assume that this is the pair. Okay? Just because uh, uh, I had to prepare some slide, but uh, it can be maybe it's the other pair. I don't know which pair is there. Uh, why is the gap smaller? Why is the gap smaller? Yeah. 
It's at least that over three, maybe it's better. If it's better, I'm just in a better case. In, in, uh, my situation is much better. But there must be one that has that over three. Do you agree with this? Yes. What? At least one. Maybe all of them. How do we know? Because we know that the sum of this, so these are, you can write this thing as a, a differences, right? So we know that the sum of these differences equals to the big difference. That's great. Then if this is zero and this is zero, then this one must be delta. So there exists one which has to be at least delta. But it's a three. So it doesn't have any uniformity. So it has all three has I don't I don't care about the content of this thing. Just look at these. These are numbers, okay? So we have two numbers which are ten ten apart, right? Two integers whose difference say is ten. Okay? And now I partition this uh, uh, two integers, I partition it into three uh, uh, um, intervals, right? So I know that this, if I had the gap, the original gap was 10, and I partition it to three uh, different uh, uh, intervals, at least one of them is as large as 10 over three. Do you agree with this? The first hybrid, so, so what? I, I didn't look at the left-hand side at all. I'm just looking at this, uh, these gaps. One of, them, one of them is at least that of uh, three. Okay, good. Okay. So maybe it's going to be the top one. I don't care if this is the one that goes between this and this. You'll see that there is no difference. Okay. So there is no PowerPoint cheating in this presentation. Right? If, if it works on PowerPoint, it works uh, on the algebra. Yeah. So, so let's assume that this is where the gap is. Okay. So assuming that this is where the gap is, so what do I do now? So remember Bob's question, right? I mean, we had to somehow plant the string that we want to determine whether it's a random or pseudo-random. So here we have a very nice place, right? I mean, there is a changing point, right? So the two, two neighboring hybrids equal on all the uh, uh, elements except for this one, right? So that's a good place for me to, to, uh, to plant the, my challenge. Was it a question? I'm not sure. Okay. So here is the algorithm B. So now, assuming that I know a pair of uh, neighboring hybrids uh, for, uh, the, which achieve this gap, so I'm giving this Y, and I'm going to pad this Y with a uniform string and now a pseudo-random string. So I'm going to plant it in the distribution in a way that if Y is green, I'm going to get the top, right? The top hybrid, but if Y was red, then I'm going to get the bottom hybrid, right? So the distinguishing gap of this A is going to be delta over three, or at least delta over three. Okay. Is it clear? So that's a very simple, but I think very clever argument, right? So that's nice. What's the problem? You need to do it three times. That's one solution. That's a solution. But what is the problem? Exactly. I have, to, I have to point out, I have to find out where the gap is. So both suggest one solution, try all of them, right? That's a reasonable solution, but I'm going to do something else, something uh, 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 slightly nicer. So okay, so this is just to summarize what I said. So the probability, in this case, the, the gap between uh, the case where y is pseudo random or random is going to be at least uh, delta over three. Okay, and we got a contradiction. So now the question is how to find the gap, how to find two neighboring, which achieve the, uh, two neighboring hybrids which achieve the gap. And now we're going to, to um, sharpen the original observation. So we said the sum of the gaps is at least delta, therefore there must be a gap which achieves the, uh, the value delta over uh, three. But actually, we prove that the average values of the delta is delta over t. Right? I mean, if the sum is delta, then when you divide by t, you get a, a delta over t. So we know that if I'm going to choose a random pair of hybrids, the expected advantage is going to be delta over t. So instead of trying them all, which I could do, I'm going to choose a random pair of hybrids. Okay, so this is the new algorithm. So it's going to change uh, to, to choose uh, an i, and I'm going to plant this uh, the, the challenge y exactly the changing point between i and i plus one. Right. And now it's not hard to show that if I chose a, a, a random uh, uh, changing point or a random pair of hybrids, 
that uh, the distinguishing advantage is going to be uh, delta over t. And now the probability is not over only over uh, um, the inputs, but also over the randomness of the algorithm. So this new B is a randomized algorithm. It chooses an I, right? And now plug in, so I, so this is like a, a, a row in the matrix, essentially. And then it's going to plug uh, the input in the changing point between this I and the next one. Okay. Is it clear? Okay. So this is a, a relatively simple uh, exercise. Good. So let's say, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. So you could you could uh, do something like this, for example. So not exactly go over all of them, but, but do the following thing. So it's similar. So I could try to estimate all these deltas. Okay. So like I'm going to ignore my inputs. I'm going to go uh, outside. I don't know and try to practice. Right. Try to learn the value of all these delta. Try to estimate it. Right. By using many many samples because this A is fixed. Right. So I can generate all these hybrids regardless of my uh, challenge. And then get a nice estimation of all these delta using, say, germ of bound or something like this, just taking the empirical average. And now I can say, okay, I can find the delta, I can approximate it well enough so I can find a good uh, distribution gap. So that's what I meant by trying all of them or something like this. Another solution is to say, okay, we're in a non-uniform setting, let's uh, just assume that I have an advice which tells me exactly what to do. So if we're working with circuits, then this, uh, this is the simplest uh, thing to do. Yes, but it's not. No, no, because it's a sim for all for different inputs of uh, ends. Right? I mean, maybe I'm using different eyes. So it's not here that I can just uh, hardwire it in the description of the Turing machine or something. So, so maybe these eyes act crazy. I don't know. Okay. So, um, so let's abstract what we did because this is a very uh, uh, this is the cryptographic technique. It, it's used everywhere. So it's called the hybrid methods. So I wanted to show the two distributions. Relatively complicated solutions uh, look the same, they're computationally distinguishable. And what we did is we defined a sequence of polynomially many distributions, H0 to HT, such that the, uh, the endpoints correspond to X and Y. Right? The first hybrid was X, and the, the last hybrid was Y. And then we showed that each pair of hybrids is computationally uh, indistinguishable by very, actually, by, by simple reason, right? by using a relatively simple argument, because we could easily embed. Like, I mean, we had some basic assumption that the PRG is good, so we can embed or, or uh, uh, reduce this assumption to this uh, uh, indistinguishability fact. And therefore, we concluded at the end that the, the two end uh, points must be uh, indistinguishable. So, like, that, that's a very, very high level template which is used all the time, and sometimes the algorithms are very complicated, they are over circuits or over, uh, I don't know, uh, trees or, or things like this, but, but uh, the, this basic uh, uh, approach is used. Uh, in, in, it's extremely, extremely powerful. Yes. 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 So, so in our case, uh, we use the polynomial uh, number of hybrids, and, and this is typically uh, the case. Okay. So this thing does it hide part of the? Okay. Good. So let's make some formal definitions. Um, you know, you travel all the way. You have to see some epsilons and deltas. So. So X and Y are probability solution over uh, N bits, and A is an adversary. So an adversary is just a mapping from N bits to a single bit. And we can define for an adversary in the probability solution the distinguishing gap of the adversary. So this is delta A of X, Y, which is just the gap in absolute value between the probability that A happens over A, X, and A happens over Y. Okay, so this is the distinguishing gap. This is a finite object, right? There is no asymptotic uh, uh, values here. So it's well defined for every A and every X and Y. Now, if we want to talk about negligible and efficient and so on, we have to introduce ensembles, right? Infinite sequences in order to have uh, asymptotic definitions. So, formally, that's what you have to do. So, we have to talk about distribution ensembles. So, this is X and Y. And you can assume that they are indexed by integers. In some cases, people index them by, by strings or other things. We have a sequence of distribution, one for each uh, uh, integer, say n. And now we say that these ensembles are computationally distinguishable if for every probability polynomial time A, now A is an infinite sequence of uh, a function given by a, a Turing machine which computes, them, computes the nth function on the, uh, on the n, n length input. So now we can ask, 
we can say that this is a computationally indistinguishable. If you, when you look at the distinguishing gap of A, when it's restricted to X and Y, the function, so this is as a function of N, is negligible. And that's the formal uh, uh, notion that we have. Well, I'm not going to use the, the, uh, this thing, but, but just, uh, or at least in a formal way, but, but uh, it's, it's good to keep in mind that we have to talk about the uh, ensembles. And now we can define what a pseudo-random generator is. So it's a deterministic, a, a deterministic efficient function G. It must be expanding, so it takes n bits to n bits where m n is larger than n, so the output length is larger than the input length, right? That's, that's what the, old, the old point. And this ensemble of random images of the PRG is computationally distinguishable from the uniform ensemble. So I'm using u sub m n to denote uniform strings over a, a, of length n, right? And then again is a function of n. So I'm not going to talk about the symptotics. I mean, everything, when you look at the reduction and the proof, it's, it's easier to think uh, of everything as it uh, works over uh, uh, some fixed input length. But whenever we talk about uh, these, uh, these uh, things, we, we have to remember that we actually talk about infinite uh, objects. At this point, we talk uh, asymptotically. OK, so some useful facts. And, uh, again, we want to feel comfortable with these notions. So the high-level effect to see several uh, instances of this fact says that essentially distinguishability works as a distance. Right? So we have an intuition about uh, what, what is meant to be indistinguishable, it means to be close. So this intuition holds. Right? So let's see uh, uh, more precisely. So we have transitivity, right? If x is computationally distinguishable from y, and y is computationally distinguishable from z, then x and z are also computationally distinguishable. That's wrong. Uh, let's see. Sequence such that every but you don't see on the slide an exponential sequence. But if that's correct, then it's true for any length of So here is a nice exercise by Boaz. Show that uh, uh, you, this thing does not imply that you can take an exponential uh, uh, chain of distributions. Right? Remember, x and y are in the distribution ensembles. So, so let me repeat uh, Boaz's question. So Boaz said, if this is true, and I'll show you that it's true in a second, then it means that you can take exponentially many x1, x2, x3, etc., and show that if each one of them is computationally distinguishable than the other one, then overall the two endpoints, even our exponentially many uh, entries, are going to be computationally distinguishable. And Boaz said correctly that this thing, this fact is false. Just a minute. Okay? So do you get uh, Boaz's point? So Boaz said, if you generalize this fact, this transitivity to exponentially many objects, then it doesn't hold. Which is to agree with this statement. So he says, why doesn't this statement imply the exponentially many uh, uh, ensemble statement? So think about it. If you try to prove that this thing implies exponentially uh, many uh, uh, hybrids and show, uh, show uh, it, it's very instructive to see where the proof fails. Okay? So this fact is true, just to summarize, maybe I confuse some of you. So this state is, this statement is true, we'll see a proof in a minute. But it doesn't hold for exponentially many uh, distributions. Because it's not the same relation somehow. It's an exercise. OK. So, um, yes. so let's prove it. At least uh, let's gain some confidence on this fact after we were a bit uh, shaken. So, um, so let's look. Let's fix some adversary A, some efficient adversary A. And let's see. We have to prove that uh, the distinguishing advantage between x and z is negligible. Right? That's what we want to prove. But we can write it, but just using the triangle inequality, we can upper bound it by, by the probability that by the distinguished advantage between x and y and y and z. Right? If you open the definition, you can see these are just the uh, gaps. These are just the uh, uh, differences. So the difference between these big quantities can be by, uh, uh, upper bounded by the differences between this uh, intermediate quantity, right? z. It's intermediate. So it's basically a triangle inequality. And this holds for every A. Actually, this fact is true for every A, even inefficient A. Okay. So this implies this fact. OK, so we have uh, one uh, property, transitivity. Question, I think, to ignore the question. Yes? I just want to elaborate a little bit on the boss point. If you refer to the previous example of distinguishing between uh, the pseudo-random and the uniform, uh -huh. then if you allow for arbitrary long strings, then just you can uh, see that uh, when you do the pseudo-random case, you get a birthday in uh, 2n over 2. Right. But if you do the uniform case, you get a birthday in 2n over 2. 
Yeah, it actually if this sequence is long enough, you can just invert the pseudorandom generator, right? You have enough time. Which is, which is somewhat, uh, I think, more elementary. But, but you are right, right? I mean, so once, so there are many ways to, to break this thing when you have exponentially many strings. You, you are right. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the next, the next fact. It says that this uh, uh, distance, this notion of uh, computationally uh, distinguishability is preserved under efficient computation. So if you take two things which are indistinguishable, and you apply on them some efficient, maybe probabilistic uh, uh, function, then you'll get the two things which are indistinguishable. That's a very important fact, and it's very useful, and it's also a, a, it's a crucial property, actually. We really need it in order to, to, to make the whole thing useful. Right, and intuitively, right, if you have like a, a twins which look the same, it cannot be the case that by putting a hat on them, on both of them, you can somehow distinguish them, right? I mean, uh, that's exactly what this, this thing says. So you cannot just apply a function and then they will be distinguishable. Why? Exactly. So, so here is the proof. So it's a contrapositive, exactly as Gilad said. So let's assume that uh, you can distinguish the two, two guys. It means that you have some adversary A for which the distinguishing gap between f of x and f of y is non negligible. Right? Let's call it epsilon. But now I can define a new adversary which goes to the twin, puts a hat, and then tries to distinguish. Right? That's the new adversary. So it takes, apply f, and then uh, uh, applies the distinguisher a. So this is b. And since a and f were efficient, then uh, the composition of a and f are also efficient. Is also efficient. Another distinguishing advantage of b is just by definition, exactly the distinguishing advantage of a applied to f of x, and f of y. Right? So we got a contradiction. Yes? I think if we would call it locally transitive, then it would be correct. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know, these names, these names are for convenience, this is the mathematical content. Uh, no, it's, it's correct anyway, regardless of how I call it. I could call it like a... No, it's not. It's, it's so... We can discuss this. We can discuss it and I'd be very happy to see that it's wrong. You can exchange for the question many times, but you cannot exchange this for the question many times. I, I think that it's better to, to talk about it after, after solving the exercise. No, let's talk to it after the <laughs> It's correct. <laughs> it, it's not mine, but it's correct. I mean, it's, um, but I, I, I agree, like, there is something very confusing going on. Okay, so, so remember, these facts look uh, very innocent, but uh, it's somewhat, uh, they're somewhat tricky. Okay, so uh, we're happy about this thing. And another fact is that if you take, a, say, a x and y, which are indistinguishable, and x prime and y prime, which are indistinguishable, then if you look at the joint distribution, and here again, I assume that these things are independent, so we work on distribution, not on random variables, then this thing, x and y together, is computationally distinguishable than x prime and y prime. Okay? And how does the proof look like? Exactly. So we saw actually the proof of this thing, right? I mean, we talked about pseudorandomness and uniform, but it's actually the proof uh, generalizes to this case. So. Okay. Okay. So we have these three facts, and we're going to use them uh, 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 soon. So they are very useful to 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 remember. So let's uh, talk about uh, constructions. So we, we talked about the property of pseudorandom generators, but now the question is, uh, can we construct other pseudorandom generators? So hopefully there are sort of random generators, otherwise we are wasting our time. So here is fundamental theorem, maybe the fundamental theorem of cryptography. So it says that uh, if one way functions exist, then there are sort of random generators. Right? So I'm not sure that, uh, um, that you can appreciate enough this, this uh, theorem. There are many comments to say about it, but, but in, in a sense, it's like saying, you know, uh, um, if there are stones, then there are diamonds, right? I mean, so one way functions, I mean, uh, they are very nice and they are very uh, uh, useful, but, but if you think about it, at least heuristically, they are very common. Like, if you, if you go around and find a function in the street, it's most likely it's going to be one way, right? I mean, uh, unless you are lucky and it's linear, or there is some miracle that is going, that, that happens there, 
Uh, it's likely, it seems, at least heuristically, I'm not saying, I'm not stating a theorem, but it seems that it's going to be one way. And indeed, if you try to, as an exercise, to heuristically construct a one-way function, it's not such a hard task. It's not going to be efficient enough to, to use maybe in the fast application in practice, but, but uh, it's not a hard task. Basically, start with any like a kind of simple non-linear operation, maybe even local, and iterate it enough times, you'll probably get, again, heuristically, you'll probably get a one-way function. But when you talk about pseudo-random generator, it's much a, a subtle a, a creature, right? I mean, this thing should look like a, a, a truly random string. So, for example, the first bit cannot be biased, right? Towards a one, say. Also, the collection of all 10 bits together should look exactly uniform, because an algorithm can check exactly the distribution of these 10 bits. Actually, it's true also for log n bits. So there is some non-trivial combinatorial property. Another example that you can have in mind, so we believe that when you take two random integers, say primes, but also integers, it's probably also true. So take two random primes and multiply them together, you will get uh, something which is one way. Right? It's hard to invert. But is it pseudo-random? So now you have to think about it. Even proving that, I don't know, that some piece of the thing is pseudo-random is, is a highly non-trivial task. Right? I mean, you have to dive in the number theory and try to think about the structure of this integer. Right? I mean, it's going to be a random product of two primes. Maybe it has some properties. Like for example, we know, if you look at the standard representation, we know uh, uh, um, that it's unlikely to be, right, it cannot be like even, for example, right, if you just uh, use the binary expansion. So the least significant bit is going to be a, a one. But you can also think about other, uh, like, less degenerate representation, and it's not really hard to argue that this thing is pseudo random. Yes? Just explain how to make pseudo random generator out of uh, one way function. Yeah, so, so I'm going to, so, so I'm just saying, for now, I'm just trying to convince you that pseudo-random generator is a mountain, whereas a, a one-way function is a small hill. Right, there is a very big gap between these two things, okay? So hill, of course, is, is the name of, of, of the, the author, so it's Hastad in Pagliazzo, Levin, and Luby. And the theorem shows that you can start, you can take a one-way function and transform it into a pseudo-random generator. So remember that we show that the other direction also holds. So any pseudo-random generator gives you trivially, right? is by itself a one-way function. So this theorem says that the two objects are essentially equivalent. So it doesn't mean that every one-way function is pseudo-random generator, but in a world where one-way function exists, also pseudo-random generators exist, and vice versa. Okay? So in this sense, they are equivalent, and uh, it's essentially saying that the PRGs are uh, feasible. So it's not clear, without this theorem, it's not clear, uh, imagine that you live in the 80s and you see for the first time the notion of pseudo-random generator. It's not clear uh, that these things uh, exist. Right? I mean, you have a lot, many, many, many evidence of candidates for one-way function, but it's much harder to come up with candidates for pseudo-random generators. And the proof is complicated and beautiful, and uh, it has many important uh, concepts, like randomness extractors and pseudo-entropy. Uh, it's not practical at all, so, so it doesn't give you a practical construction, but uh, so here efficiency is polynomial time, and there is a, lot, a big loss in the overhead. Uh, and in the last few years, we saw some, uh, uh, some improvements, some of them by, by Iftach. Uh, but it's still, uh, the general uh, statement is, is still uh, not practical, but it's very important feasibility result. And it shows us that this notion is, is uh, or it gives us another evidence that this uh, notion can be achieved. So what we are going to do is to see a proof of a much weaker theorem that these uh, pseudo-random generators from uh, one-way computations. Okay. You know, we are going to assume a stronger uh, uh, object here. So let me remind you, so I'm not sure if that didn't define a sort of one, uh, one way of permutations, but uh, uh, it's basically one way function which is a bijection. So this thing is one way, it's easy to compute but hard to invert in the sense that we saw in the last time. And it's a permutation in the sense that every n bit string here has a pre image, right? An n bit string here. Okay, a single pre image. Okay. So we are going to try to construct the pseudo random generator, and actually it's a nice start because this thing it doesn't expand the input, but at least gives us a uniform distribution over n bits. Right? If you plug in a random uh, input here, you get a random output here. Okay, so it's a good start. So let's start uh, by, by, by a very uh, modest uh, uh, task and try to expand the seed by a single bit. So we have n bits, all we need is an extra. Uh, uh, pseudo-random bits in the output. But how can we obtain such a bit? Does the LSB work? The what? LSB, no. In general, no. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's very easy uh, to come up with uh, 
So, so let me wait with the answer. But no, let us be. There's no talk in general. Maybe for some functions it will work. So you can define a, a function, a one-way permutation, which, for example, has the least significant bit as part of the output here. So, so it's not going to be a pseudonym if you output the. So open your small uh, cryptographic dictionary. So hard code bits, good. So, um, <coughs> so it seems like a, a reasonable idea to output just the hard code bit of the function. So this is our construction. So you're going to output the, the permutation tied to x and the hardcore bit of x. And here you have to, so, so I assume that there is a hardcore bit, and this is true without loss of generality using the goldreich levin theorem that they've uh, uh, proved the last hour. But right, know that the goldreich levin theorem works also for a one-way permutation. So if we start by the standard one-way permutation pi and extend it to a new uh, um, one-way permutation by Adding, extending the input by another uh, vector uh, r and outputting this r in the output, right? I mean, we had this pi. This is pi of x. This is a, a one-way permutation. And now we can define pi prime, which takes x and r and outputs pi of x comma <coughs> r. So this, this is still a permutation. And, uh, and now we can define a hard copy for this permutation by using this r in the goldreich in the predicate. So this is still a one-way permutation. So without loss of generality, any one-way permutation has a hardcore uh, bit. And uh, to, to extend my, my previous answer, so for every fixed predicate, I can define like the LSB or MSB or the XOR of the bit or something else. I can define an artificial one-way permutation for which this bit is easy to compute. It's not going to be hardcore. Okay, so we have this construction. This is a, a nice candidate, but let's say, how do you prove that they're secure? So, um, it's not how to prove it directly, but let's uh, practice using these nice properties that we, we, we showed at home, and, and share, I'll give you uh, somewhat what I think is more elegant proof, but uh, maybe it's more confusing. So, um, okay, so I want to prove that these two distributions are indistinguishable. So let's do some uh, syntactic uh, uh, maneuvers at the beginning. So first I'm going to swap this is really, this is a uniform distribution, but I can view it as just as the, uh, the following uh, distribution. Take a random x, output y, and then append a random bit. You'll get here the uniform distribution because it's a permutation. Right. So this is just an equivalent way to describe the uniform distribution. Okay. And now I'm going to do something even uh, strange, stranger than, than what we did. I'm going to think about, so we had this thing, so this is a random bit. Now I'm going to think about this distribution as a, a, a convex combination of two distributions. So I'm going to generate two strings, y1 and y2, which are random images of, of uh, the permutation. And with probability half, I'm going to take the hardcore bit. Probability half, I'm going to take the complement of the hardcore bit. Okay? So these are two strings. I'm going to generate this y1 and the hardcore bit y2 and the output bit, and the complement of the output bit, again, probably the I'm going to output one of them. Right? So this is still the uniform distribution. Right? You can see that uh, uh, you can easily analyze it. Okay, now we're going to apply some uh, silly maneuver on the right-hand side. <laughs> so I'm going to take here like uh, two random strings, two random images, right, of, of the uh, one-way permutation, and I'm going to append here the output bit, and here the output bit, and probability half I'm going to output this thing, and probability half I'm going to output this thing. This is clearly just an output of the one-way permutation plus to a random input plus the hardcore bit. Right. I didn't change the distribution so far. So now we are done with the uh, uh, syntactic maneuvers. So it suffices to prove that these two uh, uh, things uh, are indistinguishable. Now I'm going to use one of the facts. I'm going to say, you know what? It suffices to actually prove that these two are indistinguishable to prove that the previous thing is indistinguishable. Why is this true? But here I put <laughs> one of them uh, probability half and so on, so I cannot use the concatenation thing, at least not as, as is. So let's assume that this pair is indistinguishable, so you can view the bigger distribution as applying a randomized uh, efficient algorithm. Right? What is this randomized efficient algorithm? It's going to choose a random string, a random output with a, a hardcore predicate, and it's going to output it with probability half, and probability half is going to output the original input. So the transformation from this, so from this small part to the large part 
can be described by a probabilistic, efficient algorithm. Right? And the same algorithm is applied to both sides. Okay, so it suffices to prove that these guys are indistinguishable, and this is actually follows almost immediately from the definition of a hard code bit. So you can write the definition of a hard code bit. So if that said you cannot uh, uh, guess the output probability better than half plus uh, uh, negligible, but you can write it as you know as as, uh, as we did in the pseudo random game, where you sit uh, in a room and you try to distinguish between the hard code bit and the complement of the hard code bit, and the two things are indistinguishable. So just by doing this, the similar maneuver, you can prove that these two things are indistinguishable. But that's it. Well done. Okay. So I feel that this is elegant but maybe confusing, so let's go from, from the end to the beginning. Yeah, I think that it's easier to say it this way. So we start by the hardcore bit saying that these two things are indistinguishable. And then we're going to argue that once you apply a randomized function to this, to this solution, you get something which is still indistinguishable. And now you observe that what you got here is actually, this is a pseudo-random generator, but this, but this is just a random string. Okay, so this is the point. Good. So we got a single bit, a stretch of a single bit, but we usually want much larger stretch, right? I mean, one bit is nice, it's already magic, but, but we want a big, a, a much stronger form of magic. And um, but if you think about it, it's highly non trivial. Like, like we want to go from n bits to say n to the tenth bits, right? I mean, so we have a one bit stretch. But we want to, to have a much larger stretch. And if you think about the picture that we have in the, in the first slide, so pseudo randomness is, is uh, in a sense, it's a question about compression, right? I mean, so we have this object which is a uniform distribution. So this is the set of all m bit string. And we want to embed a small set here, relatively small to the set of all strings, such that sampling from this set is indistinguishable from the big set. So increasing the stretch means that this set is going to be tiny. Right, so if I'm going from n bits to n to the 10 bits, right, so this is the set of all, say, n to the 10th, and this is only zero, or, uh, this contains only two um, to the n strings. So this is a very strong uh, uh, um, object to have, right? A tiny really tiny uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, probability space, which is pseudo-random. Right? And it's not clear, maybe, you know, it's possible to do it when this thing is almost, like, or half of this uh, uh, set. That's what happens uh, in the case of uh, increasing the, the output length by a single bit. Right? We have this form of uh, this, the probability distribution. But maybe having such a small set is impossible. So what do you think? Possible or not? So we can prove that once you have a single bit... Uh, uh, well, I should ask both. <laughs> <You're better not. laughs> so it turns out that once you have a single bit of uh, expansion, you can get arbitrary polynomial stretch. So this is a very strong theorem, and it's not clear at the beginning why it should be true, right? I mean, and, and again, this is a very uh, general phenomenon that you've seen cryptography. Once you have a minimal f uh, uh, amount of magic, you get all the magic like for free, right? You can transform the magic and get something which is really strong. So, um, so is the construction. So let's write the algorithm. So this is the new PRG. So we are going to uh, start with a random seed, Y0. We are going to iterate the pseudo random, the basic pseudo random generator. So we're going to generate here one bit, throw it to the output and then use the other uh, uh, part of the, of the output as a seed to the next uh, pseudo-random generator, and so on. So eventually we're going to collect the m bits, right? where m is an arbitrary polynomial. Okay. So the construction is, is clear. So now we have to prove that it's secure. How do we prove that it's secure? So we open the list of techniques that we know in cryptography, and then we see a big uh, title saying the hybrid method, right? So we have to prove it using the hybrid uh, uh, technique. So what will be the hybrids? So when we think about the truly random string, well, all these bits are going to be random. So what is the hybrid uh, distribution? So we have to define intermediate uh, uh, distributions over bits, over n bits. Okay. All right, so this is what we're going to have. So let's define the hybrid HK which says the following. In the first k iterations of the loop, 
right? You're going to output random, right? So this string is going to be truly random. Y1 and Y2, including the Bs. And now in the last iterations, right, when i is larger than k, you're going to output the PRG of this string, of the current string. Okay. So pictorially, this is what we have. And now we have to prove that a pair of hybrids is indistinguishable, right? A pair of neighboring hybrids. So we have to apply a reduction, right? So again, we start with the magic words. So assume that A, right, the syntactic A gets M bits, is a distinguisher, right, from random, from the, for the big PRG, right? From H0 to HM, which is the uh, PRG versus the truly random string, and it has a gap of delta. And our goal is to come up with a new uh, adversary B, and now syntactically know that this B gets an N plus one bit string, so this is Y and B, which breaks the original PRG. Okay. So we're going to use this hybrid in order to embed this challenge Y and B in the big uh, uh, output and then apply the original uh, algorithm A. Right. So let's see what we're going to do. So this is what, uh, so we're going to choose a random point, random i. We're going to plug in, we have this y and b i. We don't know whether they come from green or uh, red, right? So we're going to random, so we're going to plug them in. Before that, we can easily generate all the red strings by ourselves. And from this point, we can also generate all the green strings by ourselves. In fact, we can apply the PLG to this uh, y i and so on. And now, I'm going to argue, it's kind of uh, obvious, at least on the, in the PowerPoint level, but also when you write it algebraically, that if y and b is pseudo-random, then b outputs 1 exactly with the same probability that a outputs 1 on the hybrid h i minus 1. Right? This is for a fixed i. Eventually, I'm going to choose a random i, right? but this is for a fixed i. Similarly, if y is random, y and b are is a random pair, then the probability that B outputs 1 is going to be exactly as the same as the probability as the, that A outputs 1 uh, on the distribution of HI, right? Because so I plug it in the i place. So if it was red, I'm going to get that everything here was red. So this is the distribution HI. And if it's green, then I'm going to get that the distribution corresponds to the case where from this point things are green. So this is I minus 1, right? And that's it. Now let's do the calculation for random uh, uh, i, and then uh, when we embed these things. So the gap of b, when b chooses a random i and then plant the, the, the challenge in the, this uh, um, changing point, is going to be 1 over m, right? So for each i, we have probability of 1 over m to hit this i, okay? And now I have this gap, right? For every fixed i, I'm going to have this gap. So this is exactly the average gap. And by simple, similar argument, we can open this, this uh, uh, sum of uh, differences and get only the, the endpoints, right? These values are going to cancel out. So we're going to get exactly the difference between the first hybrid and the last hybrid over m, because we have the same here. So we're going to get exactly the average uh, gap delta over m. And that's it, right? I mean, so we derive the contradiction. Qu questions about the proof? Okay, so let's uh, conclude. So pseudo-random generators are wonderful in the magical creatures. They generate long strings, which are indistinguishable for. You need to assume exactly that, that you can efficiently create random strings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So probabilistic the world probabilistic polynomial time algorithms assume that they can generate random string, right? Yeah, but your goal is to generate uh, I'm not Okay, so I, I was expecting this question at the beginning of the talk, actually. So there is this philosophical question. Is there a random string? I mean, I mean, in our world, right? I mean, are there random strings? Is it uh, feasible? And if you want to like, uh, reduce your loss, so uh, how can you assume that you can generate a small number of, uh, of random bits, but you cannot generate any of them? So I didn't say that. So I, I cannot talk about this. this uh, so these questions are not mathematical questions, right? They are philosophical questions. In our models, you can always generate random strings, but I just want to uh, somehow use small random strings in order to generate pseudo random strings. We'll see later why it's useful for cryptography, but you can think of it like as a general resource. So imagine a world where you, you push a button, but it costs you one dollar to generate a random bit. So in this world, the whole discussion makes sense. Okay, so 
It's indistinguishable from one of by efficient adversaries. Right? And this, this thing may, be, uh, may look like a, a reasonable, natural, whatever, but I, I want to say that it's a very big conceptual gap. Uh, gap you know, or, I don't know, very big conceptual uh, uh, um, contribution of, of this notion. Right? I mean, the, the, the idea that you can limit yourself to efficiently computable uh, um, uh, adversaries, or efficiently computable events, is a huge idea that has a, a lot of uh, impact uh, on cryptography, and I think that in general, uh, uh, complexity theory. So as I said, it's extremely useful in cryptography and uh, uh, complexity, and, uh, in algorithms in some sense. Uh, it can be constructed for many one-way functions. Um, all this talk we had very, we talked uh, in a very theoretical way, so there are some practitioners here, I think. So in practice, there are many efficient ways to generate uh, pseudorandom bits. We have uh, many efficient candidates uh, uh, for pseudorandom generators, and it's very cheap to generate long streams of, uh, of uh, uh, pseudorandom bits. And finally, uh, remember that computational indistinguishability as a notion is a very uh, a nice and useful abstraction, not only in the context of pseudorandomness, but in other contexts as well. We'll see it later. And it has many nice and friendly properties, so uh, you should use it whenever you can. Thank you.